everyone and welcome to the debrief on ABC News Live. I'm Kimberly Brooks. Thanks so much for joining us. There's new video from that dramatic ship rescue yesterday and we're talking to one of the search and rescue coordinators of that mission. Plus we're in Houston ahead of the ABC News debate and a big surprise from Big Poppy. But first, here are your headlines. Overseas, another big setback for British Prime Minister Boris Johnson. He suspended Parliament until mid-October after lawmakers rejected his bid to hold a new national election. It follows the implementation of a new law that blocks Britain from leaving the European Union without a deal. This morning, Todd Palin, the former self-proclaimed first dude of Alaska, filing for divorce from Sarah Palin, ending 31 years of marriage to the former Alaska governor and one-time vice presidential candidate. In the divorce papers filed Friday, Todd citing an incompatibility of the temperament between the parties as such that they find it impossible to continue to live together as husband and wife. The couple is seeking joint custody of their youngest child, 11-year-old Trig. Therefore, other children are over 18. Team. A shocking sight, this Tesla on the Massachusetts Turnpike going at a high speed. The driver slumped over, appearing to be asleep at the wheel while his self-driving car cruises along. The passenger next to him appearing to be out cold too. Auto safety experts say drivers need to understand while these cars have the autopilot feature, they are not self-driving. The advanced driver assist system that Tesla calls autopilot is designed to keep people within lanes at speed uh, and in certain circumstances break, but it is not designed to control the vehicle. Tesla telling ABC News overnight, many of these videos appear to be dangerous pranks or hoaxes, saying that its system repeatedly reminds drivers to remain engaged and that at highway speeds, drivers typically receive warnings every 30 seconds or less if their hands aren't detected on the wheel. All right, we begin with what can only be called a miracle. All four crew members uh, trapped inside that cargo ship that capsized off the coast of Georgia yesterday have been rescued alive. You see it there. It was absolutely incredible. And our Kaylee Hartung is taking a close look at the ship in St. Simons, Georgia. Kaylee? Kimberly, this is as close as we have gotten to this massive cargo ship, and it is nothing short of a miracle to see it and recognize that there was no loss of life. Look right there. That is the ladder coming out of a two foot by two foot hole cut in the hull of this exposed underbelly of the ship. The path to freedom for those four crew members. They are being applauded as heroes by people in the maritime community here because those four men, they chose to stay on a burning boat. They took responsibility for the control room and the engine room and tried to ensure that a bad situation didn't get any worse. And they spent more than 30 hours trapped in what can only be described as horrifying conditions. The Authorities believe that the temperature inside the boat as it baked in the sun yesterday was greater than 120 degrees. But after more than 30 hours, it was the brave work of those rescue crews really navigating their way through dangerous and difficult conditions that brought them to safety. Again, all 24 crew members now safe. And with that, while well, the focus of the U.S. Coast Guard, it transitions to ensuring that this vessel is safely removed from the port. And the longer it stays here, the greater the environmental impact. As we were driving out here, we went through pools of oil. You could smell it at times. You know, this isn't just a shipping community. It might be one of the busiest shipping ports in all of North America, but it's also a fishing community. And, and so the fragile wetlands here, they are at great risk as oil and other contaminants from this ship affect it. And here, it could affect the livelihood of so many people. It's something we'll be keeping an eye on. Kimberly. Thank you, Kaylee. It's unbelievable to see that turned over. So I want to bring in Lieutenant Lloyd Heflin from the United States Coast Guard, um, who was part of the search and rescue mission. He is a coordinator. So um, Lieutenant Lloyd, thank you for being with us. I just have to ask you, how did you even begin to come up with the plan to rescue these men? No, thank you. Was, uh, so I got the call on Sunday, early Sunday morning, probably around two o'clock in the morning from our uh, 
senior chief Durflinger in our command center, uh, and they had been working the problem probably about 10 to 15 minutes and had launched in the initial resources to be able to uh, get out there, get eyes on scene, and uh, be able to respond. We had assets. I think the first asset got out in approximately 20 minutes. Um, and then by the, they had had a plan together probably in, in under an hour and were able to start uh, affecting uh, rescue of the, of the people that were on board the uh, capsized vessel. Uh, that included uh, two MH-65 helicopters, uh, two small boats from uh, Station Brunswick. Uh, DNR was also out there, uh, and then we also had CETO and uh, Moran had some tugs out there as well that helped affect the rescue. So uh, that was a combination of, uh, well, it was extreme innovation from our from our boat crews and our helicopters and then also our partners that were out there um, because this isn't something that uh, happens every day, um, and probably a once in a lifetime event. Um, but they were able to, to rig fire hoses to, to help people climb down from uh, access points in the vessel down to the small boats. The, hel the helicopter was able to uh, hoist other individuals that were other parts of the boat. So overall, tremendous effort, required a lot of innovation, and uh, you know, bravo Zulu to our crews that uh, did an outstanding job. Yeah, definitely outstanding. And the crew members were actually um, tapping, and that's how people were able to identify where they were. Um, big, uh, big help uh, for sure, right? Right. And that was, you know, what I was just speaking to is to the initial uh, portion of the rescue on, on Sunday night. Uh, you know, we kind of got to a point where uh, we had work, been working with Glenn County Fire Department along with the, our aircraft and boat crews and partners to be able to try and find those last four people that were in the boat and just couldn't uh, gain access. And that's where we started to also started to believe that there was a fire and there were some concerns with stability of the vessel. So we backed off a little bit. Um, because it was really outside of the um, expertise of the, of the resources we had on scene. And that's where we uh, kind of slowed down a little bit to make sure that, you know, we weren't going to put people in harm's way unnecessarily and that uh, we put together the best plan possible and had the right asset to attack the problem um, to give those guys the best chance of survival. Um, Kind of my direction was is uh, especially once we started getting tap backs and identified, uh, I think it was um, Monday night, uh, and had a pretty good idea that the crew was in there. Uh, you know, our boat crews were there tapping the entire night, letting them know that we were we were going to be there for the long haul and we were coming to get them. And we were able to to get a you know a consortium of experts in to uh, to include Defiant Marine, uh, Vertical Lift Safety, uh, TNT Salvage, and uh, Don John and Schmidt to to come in and and affect that harrowing rescue that you guys have all seen uh, at this point on the news. Well, absolutely incredible work. Um, again, Lieutenant Lloyd Heflin from the United States Coast Guard, uh, thank you for being with us today. We appreciate it. Thank you, ma'am. Yes. And guys, we now turn to politics. Um, a new poll from ABC News and the Washington Post released today, now giving the president a 38% approval rating. So I want to go to Karen Travers at the White House. Karen, good to see you. Um, this is a six-point drop since July. What does this mean for his team um, as we head into this campaign season? Yeah, 38% approval rating down from 44% in July, as you say, which was a career high for the president, still not over 50%. And the president and his his campaign are going to make the economy a very central part of his campaign strategy and his message. The strong U.S. economy is what the president cites out on the campaign trail as a reason to reelect him. But this poll shows that economic worries are really driving that decrease in his approval rating. And there are some trouble spots for the president on the economy as well. Six in ten Americans say they think a recession is likely in the next year. And that same number, 60 percent, Kimberly, say that they're worried about high prices of goods, things that they buy because of the ongoing trade war with China. The president had been doing well when it came to his handling of the economy, people giving him credit for that. We're now starting to see Americans a little bit more cynical and criticizing the president, saying that his policies have increased the chances of a recession. 56 percent of Americans have a positive view of the economy. So that's a still a good number for the president. But Kimberly, that's down from 65 percent last fall. Something is driving this major shift in public opinion. Certainly a lot of the analysts and economists talk over the past couple of weeks about a looming recession is there. But people also might be feeling it in their own pocketbooks and looking at their own family budgets.
Absolutely. So um, in other news, uh, the president is meeting with um, GOP leaders today, and uh, I want to know what Dems are wanting to see about um, gun legislation. This will be a meeting today behind closed doors. As of right now, we're not going to get to see the president meeting with the top leaders, uh, Republican leaders in the House and Senate. It's a chance for them to catch up after a long August recess. Congress is back in town. But Democrats, Kimberly, are pushing Republicans on the Hill to move forward on gun legislation, specifically tight background checks on all gun purchases. This could come up today in this meeting with the president. We've certainly heard him talking about a lot about this in the past couple of weeks. But the key here is Senate Majority Leader Mitch McConnell, and he has made it very clear he will only move forward on gun legislation if the president gives it his blessing, if the president explicitly says what legislation he would sign, what reforms he could get behind. It was notable yesterday, Kimberly, when Senate Majority Leader Mitch McConnell was laying out the agenda for the next couple of weeks, he did not mention anything related to guns. All right, Karen Travers at the White House with the updates. Thank you so much. And guys, let's head to Houston, um, where the 2020 Democratic candidates are getting fired up for the upcoming ABC News debate on Thursday. Um, so take a look here at Andrew Yang uh, riding a wave of support at an event in Houston last night. Uh, pretty fun there. So I want to bring in Lizette Rodriguez, who is already on the ground in Houston. Um, Lizette, good to see you. I know you were covering a Castro event last night. Um, what's the latest from his base. So yeah, we are just outside where he held one of the probably the biggest rallies we've seen of his campaign so far. Campaign telling us about 400 people were here. Uh, when we caught up with the secretary yesterday after his event, he told us that he's not really probably going to change much. He's already done three debates. He's already knows the topics he's talking about. What he is hoping is that he gets to talk about something like housing, something that he is obviously going to have a lot of experience in going into this debate. Yeah, and so he's also participating in a forum today um, with Klobuchar, um, Cory Booker, Buttigieg. That's correct, yes? Yes, he is. That'll be out in D.C., and then he comes right back to Houston tonight. And what can we look forward to um, down in Houston? I'll be coming tomorrow, so what is going on right now leading up to this? You know, a, a lot of the candidates are coming in, starting to get ready for debate prep, starting to study up on their topics. Others are holding events like Castro. I know Warren is going to have an event later today in Austin. Uh, we know that Better Work remains in El Paso. He's been hiking. He's been baking. And we've heard from Amy Klobuchar that she'll be here in Houston soon. Uh, when it comes to debate prep, though, she says that she wants to present herself as a moderate candidate, making sure that she is giving realistic expectations to voters. All right, so Lizette, um, I'll see you soon. Lizette Rodriguez right there in Houston. And for everyone watching, you can uh, get all of the updates um, and watch the ABC News debate um, on ABC News Live uh, on Thursday starting at 7 p.m. Eastern time. And guys, uh, Hurricane Dorian, as you know, saturated the news last week and the storm may have passed, but the effects from this hurricane will be felt for a very long time down in the Bahamas. If you remember, it was a category five when it made landfall and just sat on top of the island for more than 48 hours, devastating life as people knew it and leaving over 40 people dead. And our Marcus Moore has been there the entire time and joins us now from Nassau, um, where the recovery uh, efforts are underway. So, Marcus, it's good to see you. Um, you've been there from the beginning. I want to ask you first about um, this visa requirement uh, where Bahama citi citizens, if they want to come to the U.S., um, they have to have that visa. So tell us what's uh, going on yeah, with that. Uh, that's right, Kimberly. These are these are travel rules that have have been in place for for, for quite some time. Um, anyone who is from the Bahamas and they are a national and they don't, and they don't carry a U.S. passport, they're required uh, to uh, have a, a travel visa if they are on a cruise of some sort or traveling by uh, by plane. Um, th there had been calls for those requirements to be relaxed in the immediate aftermath of uh, of this storm. That uh, the number one priority should have been to or should be to get people to to safety and so there's there's frustration there on the part of some people who who believe that those travel restrictions are are 
perhaps putting lives at risk. But uh, there are other options for, for people who are trying to get off of some of these affected islands, and they include uh, the other islands here in the Bahamas and also Nassau, where we are right now, which has a U.S. embassy. And so there are avenues for, for people who do want to get to the U.S. They can go to the U.S. Embassy here, um, have an interview, and, and go through the process of getting an emergency visa uh, to either be with family uh, or try to start over or at least temporarily uh, go to the U.S. as the situation here improves. So uh, there are avenues, uh, but it is no doubt very frustrating uh, for people who Many of them have lost everything, Kimberly, uh, including their homes, the material possessions, uh, but also uh, loved ones who have been killed or at this hour are still reported missing. Yeah, Marcus, um, incredibly sad. So what has been going on with you um, since the storm has passed? What have you seen? Um, I, I, you've traveled to some other places besides Nassau? Yeah, that's right. We have we've seen the situation here in Nassau and how uh, this has really been a hub for not only a, a place for survivors to to go and reconnect with their families and also uh, again start over and try to figure out what they will do next. We've also seen a lot of the relief aid and and relief workers coming from Nassau to go to the affected islands of Grand Bahama and uh, the Abaco Islands and Treasure Key. Uh, also Elbow Key is an area that we saw a couple of days ago for the first time. It's popular with a, a number of vacation homes and is a community of about uh, six or seven hundred people and we saw them all already beginning the process of trying to rebuild and clear debris and pave the way for a, a, a recovery effort that will take some time. But they were imploring the government to send in more heavy equipment, or to send in heavy equipment, I should say, because they only had one backhoe there. And they are not waiting for the government in the meantime to begin the recovery, uh, their recovery. Uh, uh, then in Marsh Harbor, which is in the Abaco Islands, where we spent a lot of time, it's also where our crew rode out the storm. Uh, we have seen heavy equipment arriving there on barges, and it's, it's a clear sign that they will begin the process of trying to reestablish the infrastructure there because there's no power, there is no water. But we've also seen search and recovery teams combing through the widespread destruction there, Kimberly. Uh, the fear is that there are hundreds who are underneath that rubble and uh, they will account for the death toll that officials say is sure to rise. And right now it stands at 50, 42 people reportedly killed in Marsh Harbor and eight people killed in a neighboring Grand Bahama. Yes, and Marcus, just before we go, um, since you've been there for um, this length of time, I just have to ask, what has it been like for you to see this from start to now, the point where it is now? Um, it, it's been it's been difficult, uh, Kimberly, and you know our jobs here are to report what, what's happening and get that back to anyone who will listen and pay attention, and then you know it's up to them to decide what they uh, how they'll react to that or how they'll respond. And so you know we have been solely focused on getting the word out about what's happening to the people here in the Bahamas and also capturing the the response from Bahamians, from Haitians, and from the international community and uh, to. To see that happening uh, is, is encouraging, but I've got to tell you, Kimberly, they have such a long road uh, ahead. Uh, I was at Hurricane Katrina, and the damage that I've seen here uh, reminds me of that, but it is on a, a different level, if you will, uh, in that this is happening on an island. So you have the, uh, I'm sorry, it's happening on a collection of islands, I should say, and it's, um, it's presenting a real challenge in getting those resources in. And so um, I, I've seen the response. I've seen strong Bahamians saying that they will get through this, but I've also seen the, the despair and the, um, the, the want for, for the government, for anyone who stands ready to help for them to come and, and, and do it because they have a long way to go, Kimberly. And this is, um, I, I suspect that this will be going on for, for, for 10 years. Um, wow. At least several years, to say the very least, Kimberly. That's, that's how bad the damage is here. And um, we'll just have to see how it goes. Wow. Um, Marcus Moore right there in Nassau in the Bahamas. Thank you so much for the updates. We appreciate it.
And guys, we turn to the danger of e-cigarettes. We have talked about this a lot given an increasing number of teens admitted to hospitals with vape-related illnesses and at least five vape-related deaths. So yesterday, uh, First Lady Melania Trump tweeted saying she was concerned of the growing epidemic of e-cigarette use in children. And one of the major companies, Juul, um, coming under fire for the marketing of their products as a safe alternative to smoking. So I'm joined now by Stephanie Ebbs in our DC Bureau. Um, Stephanie, uh, good to see you. What is the new warning from the FDA uh, to Juul? Yeah, so, so this week the FDA sent Juul the latest in a series of warnings, basically saying that the company has been marketing these products as a safer alternative to cigarettes without really backing that claim up with scientific evidence. So there's a lot of concern, obviously, given the, the newly discovered illnesses that um, you know, a lot of people are using these things, thinking or assuming or being implied heavily by the marketing materials that they are safer than combustible cigarettes without there actually being enough evidence that that's actually the case. And the thing is, is that the Juul, um, this specific product, is still popular with teens, um, despite mm -hmm. the fact that the company deleted all their social media accounts. Right. Well, we all know that once something is posted online, it lives forever, right? So Juul, the company, has said that they are not explicitly marketing to teenagers. They responded to previous warnings by taking down a lot of that social media marketing. But there's still a lot of content out there online around Juul and vaping and e-cigarettes on social media, on, on other advertising platforms, even among Instagram influencers and young people just posting about their personal vaping habits. So there's a lot of concern from, from regulators that the way that young people are being introduced to these products is still through very consistent exposure to messages about them on social media, and that that's something that really needs to be addressed. And so the government is um, looking for answers. I know there's um, a CDC investigation, but the government is looking mm -hmm. for answers in, in regard to how all of these illnesses and, and deaths are coming about, yes? Yeah, absolutely. The CDC has, has really launched a full investigation into some of these illnesses to try to figure out, obviously, what is, is causing the problems, um, but also what the response should be in terms of, of how to really educate people about the risks of vaping. All right, Stephanie Ebbs in our D.C. Bureau, uh, thank you so much for joining us. We appreciate that. And guys, if you did not know, um, today, September 10th, is World Suicide Prevention Day. It's an awareness day observed annually worldwide to provide action to prevent suicide. So we have conversations on mental health all the time. And today, I'm happy to be joined by two women who are helping people um, normalize this discussion and helping people uh, release the shame of getting help. So I want to bring in ABC. Chief Meteorologist Ginger Z, and author of the book Natural Disaster, and ABC's Chief Medical Correspondent Dr. Jen Ashton, and host of the podcast Life After Suicide. Um, so, Ginger, first off, thank you for being with us. Um, I want to begin with um, a powerful post that you wrote just yesterday on Instagram, and I'm just going to read a section of it, if you don't mind, so people um, can be reminded of it. You said, I thought I would share a description from my first suicide attempt from my book, Natural Disaster. Yes, I had more than one attempt. For me, suicide was a snap decision, a dark place I woke up in for one day, then didn't feel the next day, an impulse. And then you go on to say, I can't say that anyone could have told me something that would have stopped me from doing it both times. But I do know that I would go back and tell myself that the feeling was fleeting, knowing that nothing is as final as ending your life. Life is too good. Um, Ginger, pretty powerful. So I want to ask you, why was it so important for you to um, put this post out? Well, first of all, I have to say thank you. I'm obviously in a car um, and wanted to be a part of this program because it means so much to me. Um, but I'm in, in this moment efforting the do it all uh, that we all are concerned about and get overwhelmed with on a regular basis, including keeping my regular therapy appointment. That's what I just came from. Um, so when I wrote that post, why it was so important to me to write is because it's been 17 years since my first suicide attempt. I wrote a book two years ago about my suicide attempt and haven't even told my whole story because it's 
frankly too dark and, and too scary, but you don't have to. I think that, you know, everybody lives a different truth and everyone lives a different um, journey through suicide and through depression and through all of the different mental health challenges. But this day, being able to post something when we are kind of making sure people realize that they're not alone, um, I think we're doing that. But most importantly to me, it's not about ending a stigma because I feel like we're getting there with that. It's about taking action. And that's what it took for me. It took me checking myself into a hospital, actually addressing the problem. And ever since then, finding health and happiness and joy in being able to be helped. And that's where coming from therapy right now, it's something that I'm constantly working at. It's just like we work out our bodies, it's working out our minds. And I was uh, given this opportunity where my suicide attempt, um, I did not die by suicide and other people haven't been given that. So this is my responsibility to everyone else. It's amazing. And the part where you say the feeling is fleeting, I feel is so powerful. So Dr. Jen, um, in your experience, um, your children's father and your ex-husband um, died by suicide. And you've talked about how it's difficult um, to see the signs. So how can you tell if someone is going through this? Well, first of all, I just am so proud to call Ginger a friend and work colleague and to get to see her almost every day and know her um, beyond what people just see on the screen is, you know, is inspiring to everyone. And I think that when, when I just, decided to write my book, Life After Suicide, and share not just my story of my family and how suicide affected our lives, but the stories of other suicide survivors. It was because, you know, right now the estimates are that for every person who dies by suicide, 135 people are directly affected, which means over 6 million people a year are losing a loved one to suicide. And so today and every day, we need to think about the people suffering um, and we need to think about the people who are left behind. For me, the guilt and the blame and the shame was compounded by the fact that I am a doctor and I didn't see the typical signs in Rob um, because he was very good at hiding them, but also because sometimes you don't want to see them. Um, and while he didn't have the classic signs of depression, there were some red flags looking back on our marriage that I just, you know, didn't hone in on. And so I think awareness and education and, as Ginger said, you know, asking for help, which is very hard for anyone to do, but especially certain groups like doctors and law enforcement and veterans, you know, we're supposed to be the strong ones. And so... Um, it's only after living through what I am living through and what my children are living through that I realized, as Ginger said, and as Ginger is living, um, that the real, the real sign of strength is asking for help. It's not a sign of weakness. And Ginger, I think I think the um, interesting thing that you also have mentioned is that you know this doesn't discriminate anyone. Anyone um, can be going through these feelings, and in the way that you're just so brave and courageous to share your story, it, it helps people release the shame. I hope so. I hope that that's true because um, it's not something that I'm always comfortable with. I'm even in here with my driver, Carlos. I've never talked to him about my suicide attempts, but he's hearing all about it now. Um, and I think that releasing that feeling and saying, I'm ready to talk about it. And I think that the part for me, again, is like making sure that we have a place for someone to go beyond a hotline, which are helpful. I was just talking to my therapist. I said, do those really help? Because like, you see all these conflicting. He said, absolutely. We have flooded calls on certain days of the year or certain times. Um, so there, there's definitely help in different ways. And everybody's a way of finding help is different. I just want it to be more accepted. I want the ability to go to a hospital because you're mentally ill to be just like going to a hospital for anything else that you're ill for. I want a, an annual checkup to always include mental health and to be separate um, because we should be taking care of our minds 
lives just as well as we take care of our bodies. I wanted it to be regular for people to find meditation and all of these alternative ways of, of addressing what's happening up here um, to be accepted. I think at this point in our society, drugs and alcohol rehabilitation are, I almost say, sexy, right? I think they're fully accepted. I want mental health rehabilitation to feel like that. It's, it's powerful. Um, Ginger Z and Dr. Jen Ashton, uh, we appreciate you being uh, with us today. And again, um, you, you guys can go to um, Ginger's book, Natural Disaster, and Dr. Jen Ashton has her podcast, Life After Suicide. So check those out. Um, thank you so much. And here's a list. We just posted a list of where people can get help if you are um, feeling like you need it. So guys, continue to take care of yourselves, as they said. And if you're around, you can stick around for the briefing room at 3.30 p.m. and then you can check out World News Prime at 8 p.m. and if you want to stay updated on all of these headlines um, you can go to abcnews.com or download the app. I'm Kimberly Brooks and I'll see you tomorrow. Tonight, the countdown. In just two days, the high-stakes ABC News Democratic debate. Ten candidates, one stage. So what issues do Americans care about most? Your voice, your vote. World News Tonight with David Muir, America's most-watched newscast. Overseas, another big setback for British Prime Minister Boris Johnson. He suspended Parliament until mid-October after lawmakers rejected his bid to hold a new national election. It follows the implementation of a new law that blocks Britain from leaving the European Union without a deal. This morning, Todd Palin, the former self-proclaimed first dude of Alaska, filing for divorce from Sarah Palin, ending 31 years of marriage to the former Alaska governor and one-time vice presidential candidate. In the divorce papers filed Friday, Todd citing an incompatibility of the temperament between the parties as such that they find it impossible.